Welcome back, my friends, as we continue our journey in the social metacognition, looking at the decision-making process. Uh, we know that life is filled with decisions, and if there's any under anything that is ever understated, that is an understatement. Life is filled with decisions. We make decisions all the time. We have decisions such as what friends to have, uh, what vehicle to drive, what animals to like. I mean, the end is endless to this. We, life is just filled with decisions all the days that we walk the face of this earth. Now, decisions shape our lives. And I want you to consider the following. First, that decisions are made based upon judgments. And judgments are founded upon secondary metacognitive reflection. And decisions are usually made based upon the confidence that the individual has in them and humans are constantly reflecting upon past decisions as a means of guiding future decisions. Humans are just uh, about the experiences they've had and, and they reflect upon it all the time and how those decisions turned out in order to guide future decisions. Now, confidence can be defined as belief that a specific decision was correct. Now, I want you to note that we're talking about confidence in light of the metacognitive decision-making process. And in the metacognitive decision-making process, confidence, again, can be defined as belief that a specific decision was correct. We will examine three core issues related to confidence in decision-making. Uh, the first of these is the appropriateness of confidence assessments. The second is inputs into confidence. And the third of these is correcting confidence assessments. And these examinations will certainly help us better understand the decision-making process. Now, we will begin with the appropriateness of confidence assessment. And in this, as we examine the appropriateness of our confidence assessments, two issues will prove problematic. The first of these is lack of discrimination. And lack of discrimination can be defined as the inability to determine which decisions are likely to prove correct and which are likely to prove incorrect. So discrimination might basically be uh, easily defined as the ability to determine which will work and which won't work. And certainly the lack of discrimination when we make decisions as to which will work and which won't will shake our confidence in our decision-making process. The other of these is the bias towards overconfidence. And bias towards overconfidence can be defined as the propensity to overestimate the overall likelihood that a personal decision will prove correct. Uh, we may just simply have too much confidence in our decision-making process, and that in turn leads us to not adequately examine the decision before we make it. And then when we make a mistake in that, it shakes our overall confidence. There are many inputs into confidence that are important to us, and, but we're going to look at three specific issues which will be of interest. The first of those are informational inputs. And informational inputs are decisions based on an individual's ability to identify reasons that favor one course of action over another. Now, the first of these is succumbing to uh, confirmation bias. In confirmation bias, what we're talking about is that we have one favorite route to travel, and therefore, rather than considering all of the different uh, levels of information and where they might lead us, we just pick our favorite route and go right down that, that track. Uh, weight appropriateness refers to neglecting uh, the weight of the knowledge that we have received. Not all knowledge should come in at the same level of weight. Uh, such issues as the source of the knowledge, the potential validity of the knowledge, ought to affect how we accept that weight and how we, uh, that knowledge and how we utilize that knowledge in the decision-making process. So look at this just a minute. Some of the informational inputs can be affected by us having a favorite route, and then they can be affected by our likelihood not to properly weigh the information that we do have. And sometimes uh, we're affected by limits to individual knowledge. 
Uh, I'm reminded of a saying that my father had uh, where he said, well, if you can buy a man for what he think, what he's worth and sell him for what he thinks he's worth, you're going to get wealthy pretty quickly. Uh, I like Clint Eastwood's uh, saying where a man's got to know his limitations. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of how sometimes when people get a little knowledge, they think they know everything. And then, then as they learn more, they begin to learn that they don't really know anything. The more we learn, the less we know. And, and we need, as we, as we look at avoiding our favorite paths and we look at weighing knowledge appropriately, also to understand that there are limits to how much we know and that uh, it's okay to, to recognize those limitations and to act accordingly. Uh, inputs into confidence are also affected by our experiential inputs. And uh, experiential means that decisions are based on the experiences of the individual. Uh, many of you may have been led to the conclusion that as you get older, you become less intelligent. Uh, that is uh, that is not true, and research does not substantiate that. Uh, where that idea came from was in the early days of the IQ tests. The IQ tests were analytically based, and they would give an IQ test to young people and old people, and old people wouldn't score as well. Well, what they failed to recognize is is that young people and old people may learn differently. Younger people don't have much experience, and therefore they may tend to be more analytical. Older people tend to have a lot of experience, and they base what they encounter against the experiences that they've had. Now, experiential inputs refer to those, uh, the inputs that we gain from the experiences that we've had as we journey through life. Stimulus familiarity uh, means that we're, we tend to uh, have confidence when we stand on familiar ground. Uh, you ever heard an older person say, well, I've been there before, or, or somebody telling you, as my grandfather did years ago, he told me, he said, son, I've been 16, but you had never been 60. Well, I hadn't been 60 yet, but I'm certainly pushing the lid. So stimulus familiarity refers to our standing on familiar ground. And as we stand on familiar ground and making decisions, Based upon our experiences, we are likely to have more confidence in those decisions. Decision fluency is really how quickly we can arrive at an answer. Uh, there are some things that answers are not easy to reach, but uh, when we've had a lot of experience in a particular field, we find ourselves uh, coming to the answer more quickly than we used to. And as we, as we encounter that based upon our experiences, we can reach an answer quickly, we tend to have more confidence in that, in that decision. And then decision consistency refers to the, uh, the, uh, the, the systematic approach in, in trying to reach a decision and in using different systematic approaches and yet coming to the same answer. How consistently do we arrive at the same decision based upon our experiences. So, so we have stimulus familiarity, which means we stand on common ground. We have decision fluency, which means that we can quickly arrive at an answer. And decision consistency, which lets us uh, consistently come to the same conclusion. Uh, there are also background inputs, and these are decisions based on general theories that the individual has about themselves and about the decision. Uh, we have a lot of preconceived self-beliefs of confidence. Uh, our preconceptions certainly influence the confidence that we have in a decision, and the relation of background experiences uh, inputs to our experiences. How, how do our self-concepts, our self-beliefs, uh, how, how closely do they match our experience? And if we find our self-beliefs closely matching our experience and we use those to make decisions, then we're very prone to have more confidence in those decisions. Uh, we need, just before we end, to talk about correcting confidence assessments. Sometimes our confidence assessments are wrong. And, and if we have confidence assessments which are wrong, how do we go about correcting them? 
Uh, two issues will be of interest to us in this, and the first is the expanded uh, discrimination, and this is enhancing the ability to more clearly understand which decisions are likely to be correct and which are likely to be incorrect. If you want to improve your metacognitive decision-making process, then look at how and develop strategies by which you may expand your discrimination in regard to decisions. Do you give them more thought? Do you meditate upon them more? Do you recognize your own limitations? Uh, do you understand uh, how your experiences may or may not uh, impact a specific decision? Uh, it's important that we learn how to expand our discrimination in the decision-making process and then lowering overconfidence, and this is reducing bias in the metacognitive decision-making process to more adequately assess our decisions. Now, of course, I know that Superman always makes the right decision, but sometimes we need to recognize that, that we're very capable of error. And when we're very capable, we recognize that, and we're very careful of error, and we kind of keep an eye on ourselves to keep our confident, overconfidence in check, then we do improve our ability to assess our decisions and to assess the confidence that we have in those decisions. Now, how did we do in examining the three core issues related to confidence in decision making? Recall that our topics were the appropriateness of confidence assessments, input into confidence, and correcting confidence assessments. I hope that you think we did a fair job in explaining these. I want to thank you very much for your patronage, and I'm in the Star Trek, the last generation, and in the, in the words of the Vulcans, uh, live long and prosper. If you meet a Vulcan, the proper response is peace and long life. You have a great day.